Pamela Altoff is the executive director of the Cannabis Business Association of Illinois, a membership-based organization that represents cultivators, processors, dispensary owners, and other businesses that operate within the cannabis industry in Illinois. The name might sound familiar because Pamela is a former Illinois state senator who has extensive experience in government, public policy, and advocacy. Pam, thank you so much for your time and welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here this morning. Yeah. So tell tell me and uh, my audience a little bit about yourself. I mentioned, you know, you've got a past in politics, so maybe you could mention how you got involved in politics as well. Sure. Um, by trade, I um, am an educator. I went to Illinois State University and obtained my degree, um, my BSED. Um, and then I went on to Northeastern University up here in the Chicagoland area and obtained a master's degree in special education. So for seven years, I actually taught children with developmental disabilities, um, married my husband, moved to uh, McHenry, Illinois, and could not find a job teaching. So I ultimately got involved with the communications industry and became a broker of communication properties, buying and selling TV stations, radio stations, cable properties at the, at the time was the hot item. Um, and so, you know, did that for a period of time, um, ultimately became the elected city clerk in my community, uh, then the mayor, because obviously I'm one of those. I always strive to be a little bit better. Um, and then when I was mayor, I was um, appointed to the S Senate position when my um, state senator was diagnosed with myeloma. I had um, every mayor in McHenry County write a letter to the Republican Party um, indicating that they thought I would be um, the best candidate. So I served in the state Senate for 17 years, um, you know, had uh, 99 bills that were uh, virtually all bipartisan, um, worked on significant issues with a wide variety of people, both in the House and in the Senate. So I knew um, a lot of individuals and probably was one of the very few Republicans um, that, um, you know, I'll, I'll say jumped on the bandwagon of um, compassionate marijuana or, you know, medical marijuana. Um, always felt, you know, maybe because I'm a child of the 70s in, in college, um, always felt that there was um, a, a good medicinal purpose for marijuana. Um, so became very engaged in, in those conversations and then um, had a phenomenal working relationship with now Senate President Don Harmon. We came in together, same class. Um, so when we did the uh, next piece of legislation, which was the um, reduction in um, criminal charges for small possessions of um, cannabis, and then the next, the really big one was the um, opioid alternative legislation that, that took us a, a while. Um, so it seemed, you know, kind of like a natural progression. When I actually retired, um, I was approached by a lot of the cannabis industry, um, large companies, um, not all MSOs, but the larger companies in Illinois, in the medical industry, and asked if I would help them put together a statewide trade association anticipating the um, recreational industry. And so I was hired in January of 2019, and the rest is kind of where we are today. Yeah. So that was formerly the Medical Cannabis Association, right? And Correct. Like you Correct. said, you kind and, of... And, right. We, we, we evolved into then the larger um, statewide trade association because obviously we we're going to have new players, new colleagues, um, you know, broader license types. So yeah, it used to be medical um, and that was only 55 dispensaries and 20 cultivation licenses. And so I'm the third executive director. Um, Brescia Brewer was the first, then um, Mike Kleinick, and then myself. Awesome. Well, for folks that are listening, we'll also have this link in the description. Thank you. Are you able to see the Cannabis website? Is that what I'm sharing right now? Yes, you can. I can. Perfect. Yes. It's yeah. cbail.org. Right. We'll have in in yes, cbail.org. And we have to do that because CBAI is the Community Bankers Association of Illinois. And so, um, you know, to distinguish ourselves, <laughs> we threw in that L. Um, and obviously in the beginning, the bankers weren't real thrilled that when you typed in cannabis, you went to their website. Um, so we did try and make that distinction. 
Cool. Yeah, I wanted to make sure to plug the website at the top um, so that people could connect and, and, you know, find more about it. Um, we had Portia Mittens on the show in the past. She was heard. also, I yeah, heard. yeah. So um, I got to ask you right off the top, you sure. mentioned, you know, o- always supporting cannabis. I had read in, in an article that I might return to a few times today that you had once voted against allowing medical cannabis uh, before you supported it in 2014. I, I actually voted against it probably twice. Um, oh. the, the legislation when it was first being drafted really wasn't a great piece of legislation. Um, it wasn't until Senator Bill Hain um, got a hold of it. He was a former state's attorney in his prior life to being a legislator. And he really did a lot of drug court cases and he really tightened it up and made it um, much better and clearer. Um, so I supported the concept. I just didn't like the first couple iterations of the legislation. Understood. Cool. Yeah. Thank, thank you for, for clearing that up. Sure. Uh, just because you mentioned, you know, you had always supported it. And I was like, I, I had read that before. Um, mm-hmm. Either way, I'm glad that you you saw the light uh uh if if that were to have been clarification is always i always tell people if you see me doing something that doesn't make sense pick up the phone and call i'm certain i've got a right explanation for it but but again that that was part of the whole interest is it did take us almost geez i bet you it was almost four years before we actually got a piece of legislation to start the medical program and you know it it's funny um so much has changed. I, I would tell you, I don't believe that um, the use of marijuana or cannabis um, still is accepted overwhelmingly. Um, however, back then, listen to me now, back then, um, in, in 2011, which is really when we started to talk about a medical program, the, the acceptance was, you know, small. Um, there was not uh, an overarching acceptance of the idea of even for a medical uh, pilot program by most people in the state of Illinois. It still was uh, trending relatively low. So it just took us a long time to get to where um, we finally were in 2014, where we could amass enough uh, legislators, le- legislative support to get it passed. Um, but that's really when we you know, pull that core group of legislators who really were trying to promote a cannabis program in Illinois. Absolutely. Um, So I'm curious, uh, what ultimately inspired you to become a leader in the cannabis industry? You know, again, I think I stated that it it, initially it was because I always did believe that there was um, appropriate um, properties of cannabis that needed to be uh, legitimized. Um, But what happened really is, you know, during the course of all of our conversations about crafting the pieces of legislation from 2011 to uh, finally in 2019, when we uh, passed the recreational legislation, the adult use legislation, you know, you you meet people in the industry. And I think um, my background with a lot of not-for-profits, I've served, I, I don't want to tell you how old I am, but if you look at the space, you know I'm a little older. Um, I've served on numerous not-for-profit boards, so I had a lot of familiarity. Uh, so when I retired um, and was approached by several of the larger cannabis operators in Illinois, they knew that. They, they knew that I had that kind of trade association, not-for-profit background, as well as being extraordinarily familiar with the legislative process. So I just think it was um, an opportunity at that time. I was at the right place having been retired. They were really on the edge of looking for somebody who could help them formulate that trade association and also, you know, help them work through the negotiations of the adult use legislation as well. So um, it just, you know, the synergy was right. Yeah. Well, I want to, I uh, promise you we'll talk about the industry, which I feel like is, is sure. definitely your forte, but one of my like passions uh, is the, what I felt was the original goal of the CRTA, which is to end the criminalization of cannabis. Um, and I just kind of wanted to jump head deep into a concept that I actually just recently read this morning from a former regulator, Shalene Title. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. She's yeah. formerly from the Massachusetts Commission. 
Um, and she even worked alongside David Lakeman. David Lakeman. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And so one of the things she said actually this morning that, that caught my eye and really it's going to help me, I guess, get right into this topic is that I feel we don't want to focus so much on eliminating the underground market that we forget the goal of legalization, which was to end, not continue these patterns of discrimination and disparate enforcement. And I guess just, I know that that might seem vague, but I wanted to ask what is the cannabis business associations uh, uh, position on home grow the topic of home grow. Cause I really feel like it relates to the ending of criminalization okay. as we know it. Sure. Sure. Um, we were part of that conversation when the um, adult use legislation was um, passed. And currently you are allowed, if you are a medicinal patient, you are allowed the opportunity to grow up to five marijuana plants in your home subject to a, a broad range of restrictions. You know, you can't have it in your front window. You have to have it locked in your home so that your children can't get access or any child can't get access. So there, there's a wide variety of restrictions to that. We're obviously very supportive. Um, we've run into a little bit of, of a bump as we've not been given any guidance on how to actually provide in our dispensaries that product to our medical patients. Um, you know, it, it, the funny story I say is, you know, most people don't want seeds in their actual um, pot usage. <laughs> right. So do, do we do we sell seeds? And if we do, do we only sell five? Can we sell more than five? Um, you know, there's there's no guidance in the legislation. Can we sell clones? If we sell clones, do we have to deal something with, you know, um, proprietary rights on, on that strain? There's just there's a lot of questions. So while we're extraordinarily supportive, because, again, the industry is so highly regulated, we want to make sure that we're not coloring outside the lines and that we're doing what the state of Illinois had anticipated. Um, with regard to home grow for just in general, we again bump up against federal regulations um, with regard to, obviously you can't do it in any kind of situation that has a federal um, connection. So federal housing can't do it. Somebody has a loan with a bank that has, um, you know, a federal charter can't do it. So again, we're, we're supportive of the concept. We just have major reservations about how we enact that. And we're waiting for further guidance from the state. So, and another thing I've heard to your point regarding seeds is that, uh, that we actually heard this from the Cannabis Regulation Oversight Office themselves, is that BioTrack doesn't even allow for static items to be sold. That's so you, correct. you couldn't even if you had the guidance. Could I have you, for the sake of clarity, like you mentioned earlier, um, one of the articles that I see pointed to constantly, kind of with a little bit of a uh, Maybe consternation is not the right word, but when people, critics of CBAI point to when they talk about CBAI and what they don't like, they mainly point to this article. Can you see my screen right now? Uh, yeah, I can see your I'll, screen. I'll read it for our audience. So this is the very bottom of an article, and I want to get to some of these other topics. These are industry related, but at the very bottom of this article, it and this is actually an article that talks about when you were first hired, by the way, it's kind of interesting. Um, so it says, in addition to licensed growers, there's also a question of whether and how much will be allowed to grow at home. A previous bill proposed five plants per home, which licensed growers and law enforcement propose or oppose. Proposed. So did uh, you said you're uh, like extraordinarily supportive of it. Do you oppose it for the reasons that you just said, though, or like what what the, the, again, currently the law today is that medical patients can grow, can right grow up to five plants. So it's it's not a, a matter of opposing or supporting. It's getting further guidance from the state on where they want the program to go. So. We were very supportive of what happened with the five plants um, for medicinal patients. Again, the, the bump in the road came when nobody said how that was going to happen. You know, same situation, kind of do we close our eyes? And when people actually are growing plants in their homes, not asked the question, where did you get that? You know, how did you start that plant? 
Um, and as for further conversation as to whether or not individuals can grow in their own homes, there's a huge amount of conversation that needs to occur on what that's going to look like. So, but it's so, so I would tell you the association is very interested in having further conversations with the regulators on coming up with an established program. Um, those conversations have not received our in, in response to our inquiry. Those inquiries have had no response from the state of Illinois. And obviously, we have a highly regulated cannabis program, probably the most regulated in the entire country. And so we're looking for further guidance and an opportunity to weigh in on how we are to move forward. We, we don't, you just said, Nicole, we don't even have direction or an ability of BioTrack to track those sales. We need to figure that out before we have a further conversation on whether or not people can purchase it and grow in their own homes. So I, I understand what you're saying, but I guess like my question is, is your only objection the conflict between federal and state law? Because it sounds like that's what you're saying. Because other states have done this with little to no issue. And I'm just trying to understand the I'm opposition. I, I, again, what I'm telling you is that the association hasn't taken a formal position on um, home grow have you seen though that members have like members mm -hmm. of your association have they yes. wrote the fallacy of home grow they say it's going to make it impossible to eliminate the black market back to my comment from Shaleen. um it, it, they've got like five different points i'm reading from an older article uh that i just googled because i had to remember what it was called um how do you reconcile like do you, there are members of your organization that do oppose home right. grow correct so what we do as an association is we run a legislative survey and have discussions about what our positions are. Um, home grow for individuals outside the medicinal market has not come up as a legislative priority because we haven't been able to engage in any conversations with anyone about remedying the issues we're having with the medicinal side. So we need to then take care of that, making sure we have um, the software available, uh, answering the questions on how we package. And then yeah. we can start to talk about whether or not we can enter into a full adult use market as well. So it hasn't, it hasn't come up as a legislative priority in our association. Obviously our members are entitled to their own opinions. Right. Um, do, you, do you think there's any possibility of it becoming a priority because um, it's arguably similar and less complex than brewing at home. Perhaps. Um, I think in the grand scheme of what we are grappling with in the state of Illinois um, regarding uh, up and coming businesses, this, this is a um, low priority on the scale. Yeah. And I guess my last, maybe my last thought on this, and I'm just curious to hear your take on this. I know, like you said, people are entitled to have their own opinion, um, but some critics argue that prohibiting home grow is a way to protect the profits of licensed cannabis businesses. How would you respond to those criticisms? Again, the criticism would be is we're grappling with getting new license holders up and running, and that's more of a priority to the association than the home grow is at this particular point. We, we want cool. to meet the goal of the state of Illinois, which is to create a diverse industry. Um, and that's what we're committed to first and foremost. Sweet. Well, I will, I will segue to the licensing thing. Cause I feel like you're going to be sure. like better able to speak on those things, but I just want to like, before we get off of this topic, unless I think of something else on it, it really goes back to the cannabis control act of 1978. Would you agree that the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act repealed very little of that? It really just made it so that 30 grams or less. Like, have you, are you familiar with the Cannabis Control Act of 1978, first of all? Not, you know what? Probably not as well as you are. So it's, it is what established the graduated set of penalties for cannabis. cannabis. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like the idea of if you have this much, then you get a bigger sentence. And let me just say that most, most of those uh, penalties are still alive and well and being enforced today. 
And I guess my question is if the goal of this was to, cause you know, when we're about to talk about licensing, which is we've, we've got the disproportionately impacted uh, licenses for people that were disproportionately impacted. But the reason I started with this and the reason I think it's so important is people were disproportionately impacted. What were they disproportionately impacted by? The, the penalties in that specific. And they, they still exist. So it's like, what are we doing? Did well, we, or did we fail? To, you, have, <laughs> you know, well, you have to remember, um, states are stepping out and legalizing a product that is still not recognized at the federal level as a legal substance. It's a schedule sure. one drug. So hard for the state of Illinois to, you know, turn around what was done at the federal level. We are in constant um, contact and a you know, shout out to our, our federal legislators. All of them um, contact us and talk extensively about the industry and what's happening in the state of Illinois. I would tell you they're very well educated. Um, we're still hoping for safe banking, which is just to allow legalized cannabis operators access to financial services that any other legalized business has access to. Um, and we did create the opportunity for citizens of Illinois to have their records expunged as long as it was for, you know, um, an offense that now is no longer a criminal offense. So you, you take baby steps, you do what you can, and you continue to educate so that the public feels more comfortable with the idea of a legalized cannabis market. Yep. And, and I just, I know this is going to feel a little bit on the nose, but I just, for clarity's sake, so you support medical home grow, obviously you need some guidance on how you would help those medical patients get seeds since the law now allows for that, but we don't really have guidance. That all makes sense to me, but it does sound like you're hesitating to support adult use home grow because of the federal, the, the mixture of federal law and state law. Would that be accurate for me to take home? No. Um, what would be accurate is, is I am hesitant to give you a position from the association when none has been taken. Fair. Okay. Fair. That makes sense. I really, uh, if you can't tell, I really love the Cannabis Business Association to take this because I feel like. Uh, it's, it's, you, cold, it's not that we're not talking about it. It's that we don't, we don't have um, the format uh, to, to discuss it broader than, you know, again, just starting to have those conversations with our stakeholders in this state. Yeah. Sorry. The, the thought I was just going to say is just like these brands, they talk about pioneering and investing in social equity and everything else. And I thought what more powerful of a statement than to be able to say, Hey, we back home grow, we back the, we support the ending of the criminalization of cannabis entirely. Right. But, yeah, I, again, I, I can't, I can't speak. I, I know can't you can't speak this, on yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's an I, association. I can speak for me, so. but I'm not going there. So yeah. Right. Fair enough. Okay. You get where I stand on that. So let's talk I do, about. I do. I understand. Let, let's talk about uh, the cannabis industry. Sure. Um, so this is a good question for you. I think, and maybe we can, this will open us up to talk about social equity. How does I recently saw you actually appointed several board members. We mentioned Portia, Ambrose mm -hmm. Jackson, who we've mm -hmm. spoken to a few times on the show. Uh, Gabe Mendoza, I believe, was another one. Am I Gabe Mendoza has been, he, he was a founding board member. He's been on the board since the very beginning of the trade association. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. I must have, I must have. No, that's okay. He, he that was reelected. Their terms are for two years. And so he's running, he ran again that and must be. appointed. Yeah, 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 yeah. That must be, I was about to speak to him actually as well. Um, but he just had a child, it sounds like. So congratulations to Gabe. Um, yes. so how does the CBAI advocate for the interests of cannabis businesses in Illinois? Um, um, we, pr I think, I believe we provide a format for, um, different license types and different stakeholders to come together and, um, not only network with each other, but also um, create a platform of issues that we agree on. We take them out into the public. We have an educational program. We obviously work with legislators. And then we always work with the regulators themselves on trying to streamline issues that, that we found some difficulty with. Um, we also have events, a lot of events, um, new information. We just uh, 
signed on to a contract with Grown In for a lot of training opportunities and event opportunities. So, you know, it's, it's normalizing the use of cannabis as well as ensuring we're creating um, networking opportunities so that our new license holders can find contractors that have been vetted, um, we know are honest and good, things of that nature. Um, any upcoming events that you wanted to plug or should people just uh, stay wait, tuned? Well, it's April. And what does that mean in April? It must be close to 420. That's right. Uh, and so working with, again, Grown In, we're planning a large event in front of the Merchandise Mart. Um, hopefully we'll be able to showcase some products early morning. We're calling it Wake and Make. Um, so ho hopefully some, um, you know, baked goods as well as some nice coffees. Cool. Uh, Brad actually invited me to that. So I may see you there if you're going to be there. I, I intend to be there front and center. So I look forward to seeing you in person. Cool. Uh, maybe I'll make you laugh here. Are you going to be blazing it up? I, you know what? Never in public. <laughs> and you never know what? I, I have to tell people I don't smoke. I am not a smoker. Um, never have been. So um, my ingestion is, is not through flour. It usually is through an edible. Oh, coffee cool. is coffee is really good. I do a lot of um, honestly more tinctures, you know, into okay. my tea, into my coffee. Um, I find that easier to dose for me. So right, right, yeah, cool, yeah. Um, and then some of the other events is you know we have a lobby day in Springfield and um, collaboration with IMA, um, the uh, Beer Association, as and Irma. Um, so on April 26th, we'll be in Springfield and we'll be visiting with some of our uh, legislative advocates and uh, working our agenda. So that's another large event that we provide for all of our members to attend. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, oh, I guess I should ask one more clarifying question and then we'll get right back to the industry. Sure. That paragraph that I showed you that yeah. said a, a previous bill proposed five plants per home, which license, gr license growers and law enforcement oppose. Some people, including even myself, I will be honest, have taken that to mean that you like held hands with the cops on this. Is that true? Or did you work to get like, what is what what did it look like? Did you actually um, what it looked like is it, it, it what it looks like in all legislation. And when I said a previous bill, what what year was that? Um, that was 2019. So that was the that was the original CRTA proposal, which included uh, that allowed all adults to cultivate. Right, right, yeah. right, right, right. And and they paired they paired that back. No, back, we yeah. we actually all the stakeholders were sitting around, um, you know, several rectangular tables and discussing and negotiating what should be in and what shouldn't be in. And actually at that time, um, Deputy Governor uh, Mitchell was uh, conducting those negotiation sessions and he was hearing from everyone. You know, he opened the floor and he said positive, negative. So everyone had the opportunity to kind of express themselves. And at that oh. particular time, I can tell you, you know, CBAI, um, it's, it's always the devil's in the details. It's not the concept, concept is fine. Tell us how you're going to actually um, regulate that program. And then that's where our expertise from other states, having been in other states and other programs, that's when that comes forward. And we basically can say, yes, that's a good idea. No, we don't think that that worked in Washington or Colorado or whatever. Cool. Um, so uh, back to licensing. Sorry to take us back to that for a moment, but okay. I wanted to make sure to clear that up um, because it's something that, like I say, people say, and sometimes I've even said so. Please, please don't. And I, I would tell you, um, you know, the, the biggest issue with a lot of those negotiations was trying to craft a bill that obtained 30 votes in the Senate and the 60 votes in the House. And you have to understand there were a lot of legislators that didn't feel that they could go home and convince their own constituencies that to allow home grow was in the best interest of communities. So there was a lot of pushback from, from that as well. Not just, not, you know, again, not just the industry and people who were interested in growing at home. There was a lot of pushback from legislators themselves. Got it. Um, what type of policy changes or legislation uh, would you like to see at the state or federal level? You mentioned safe banking. I've seen you guys post about 280E, so sorry for answering your own question. Uh, feel free to expound on those, but any others? 
Well, safe banking is extraordinarily important um, for all states that have a legalized adult use program. Um, the limited availability of particularly new license holders and gaining capital um, is just it's unbelievable. You have to then go to your family, your friends, or investors to find capital, and it's extraordinarily an expensive beginning undertaking. Even if it's just a dispensary that you're opening, you know, camera um, security is is usually a quarter of a million or more just for your initial opening. So it's it's needs to be heavily heavily capitalized, and obviously, when you limit access to financial services makes it even more difficult. So that's crucial at the federal level. Um, 280E, same situation. Um, it is estimated um, by departments of revenue as well as investment um, entities themselves that if without 280E, which would allow um, cannabis operators to deduct normal business expenses, that they lose up to 50% of their profitability. And again, anybody who knows business knows that Beginning businesses typically invest their prop, their profits back into the company. And just think about it, 50% of that is going to the government because they, they can't deduct those um, expenses. So that's extraordinarily important. And we think that's true for not only the existing industry, who, by the way, has been dealing with that for over eight years now anyway. It really is for the new operators who already are limited in finding financial options. Um, the other issue that's extraordinarily important to the association um, is the development of a commission. We really believe that if there was the establishment of a cannabis commission, similar to the liquor commission and the gaming commission, many of the issues that the industry experiences and has to wait for the General Assembly to clarify or determine what was meant by the original legislation could be handled a lot more rapidly with a lot more nimble flexibility. Um, also, uh, one of our other issues is again, badging. We think that there should be, like there was a universal transit card. We also believe there should be a universal badge that if you go to work for a large company like Cresco and you receive a badge, it should be able to be used in their dispensary and their cultivation sites anywhere in the state of Illinois. Right now, when you are issued a badge, it's good for this facility only. And we think that that's somewhat limiting for, you know, promotional or for just management of employees. So we think that that should be created online application and an appeal process um, similar to all other kind of state IDs. If your name is Mark Smith um, and Mark Smith has 105 hits on it and some of them aren't so good, you might be rejected. We would like an appeal process to be able to go back and say, that wasn't me. That, you know, I'm not that Mark Smith. So those things are, are extraordinarily important. Um, in addition, we also think that there should be a moratorium on uh, transporter license uh, applications. There already are in excess of 200 licenses and there's not really any business for these operators yet. So we think that you know the continual um, award of these types of licenses just makes it harder for individuals to get up and running and have a successful operation. Um, what else? Oh, um, and also there's a discrepancy between the CRTA and the compassionate use legislation, where when we passed the original medical compassionate use, we prohibited anyone with a drug conviction to gain access for employment we did not do that in the CRTA. In fact, quite the contrary, we took the position that those that were disproportionately impacted should have access to the industry. We want to make sure that both of those are the same, leaning obviously to people with prior cannabis convictions can gain access into the industry for employment purposes. Um, it was an oversight, it hasn't been fixed yet, but it makes it very difficult for individuals to be hired at either a cultivation site or a dispensary that does both medical and adult use product. They're prohibited by that act. So we'd like to fix that too. So there's just, just a lot of cleanup things that we think are non-controversial um, that the General Assembly could take up rather rapidly. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, 
sorry, I was trying to remember all the, cause you okay. mentioned Please. commission and agency. Oh, the badging thing. I, yeah. I thought you might like this analogy cause you, you mentioned one, but I love the analogy of like a hair license where it's like you get a license to cut hair, like maybe so, so to, to follow the analogy, maybe you get the license to be a bud tender then maybe you could be able to, because I've heard that the way badging works can actually almost lock people into a job. And let's mm -hmm. say that there's a better dispensary that just opened up and they're like, hey, you're a good bud tender. We want to get you on. But then, like you say, there's all this red tape with the with the badging. And sometimes, depending on the financial stability of the person, that may not be an option for them because they would have to forgo payment for a period of time. And, That's correct. Right. As you start yeah. the new job and they withhold two weeks of your salary, you may not have that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So th so. Those are the kinds of, you know, and again, I, I would tell you that they are um, operational um, unanticipated challenges that we think not only are good for the existing industry, but obviously for anyone who is just starting their operations, it's, it's good for the whole. Yeah. So I want to get back to the idea of uh, the commission because mm -hmm. I was in a recent meeting and I, I honestly don't know how to make heads or tails of it. So maybe we can have a good discussion here, uh, but you mentioned a moratorium on transport licenses and I've read in the past uh, actually, that article that I just referenced, there's a quote that you said, my organization believes that they have the current capacity to meet demand uh, until we see substantive data that indicates differently. We support no new cultivation licenses. And I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned a moratorium. That's something other states have done, including the state of Oregon, which many people point to is a completely open market. We've had the uh, former director for the regulatory body there. His name's Steve Marks. I'm struggling to remember his official title, but he was at, the, he's kind of like our CROO, right, uh, right. except he also oversaw the liquor control stuff. Anyways, though, um, they've recently issued a moratorium. So, you know, people always point to Oregon as like being open and wild. And I thought I was under the impression that that was still the case. And he told me, no, they have issued a moratorium. Um, so I wanted to ask, the cannabis industry seems to welcome limitations on license issuance, unlike other industries with high failure rates. What sets the cannabis industry apart in, in this regard? And, and let me clarify, we're not saying um, a moratorium on cannabis licenses. We're saying a moratorium on transporter licenses. Transporter licenses doesn't have in the CRTA any type of cap. Sure. But so ours, that's, um, that's, I guess what I'm asking is, do you support caps on licenses and why does the cannabis industry seem to welcome those types of caps? Um, precisely for what you just pointed out, Oregon. Um, the caps actually were not um, a suggestion or a recommendation from the industry. The caps were a recommendation from the actual uh, drafters of the um, legislation. And it was because they wanted to have a very slow, methodical, procedural rollout. They wanted to make sure they were not following in the footsteps of Oregon that produced more product than um, was needed, drop the prices, kind of crash the market for a while. Um, we learned from those experiences. And so this was in the beginning, let's set a framework. Let's set kind of a, a, a limitation that can always be changed as the market grows. And so that was done with a great deal of forethought, forethought by the actual drafters of the legislation. So I'm just curious, I asked Steve Marks, the the head, like I said, of, of Oregon's cannabis control, uh, you know, uh, does he regret or, you know, would he have done it that way again? Mm -hmm. And he said, first of all, that's not my job to say, but if you're asking my personal opinion, I will tell you that I would have done it that way again. And he said, the reason why is because people, the people that, went through that, knew what they were getting into, and at least they had the chance. And I'll just contrast that with a comment that former cannabis czar Toy Hutchinson said. Uh, there were 4,500 applications for what would be 75 licenses. We knew 99% of people weren't going to get them. So it seems clear to me that the cannabis industry welcomes limitations on license issuance to prevent wholesale prices from dropping. 
I will right. tell you, your your Toy Hutchinson is not a cannabis operator. I said former but, cannabis czar. Okay, no, but she's not. She was a legislator and actually drafted that legislation. Mm-hmm. So you, what you're attributing to the industry is the industry's position on capping was not the industry's position. It was the state's position. That was a position taken by the legislature on how they wanted to roll out a recreational program. Maybe, sorry, I'll back up. And I know that you can't speak up on your individual people, but Cresco, GTI, they all say they look for li- uh, states with limited licenses, high tourism, high population, and that this is what guarantees their returns. Our next guest, though, has a personal connection to this story. His great-grandfather helped build the Jim Beam Whiskey Empire. The family later divested its stake. Now, he says doing business on the cusp of regulatory change has worked out for his family in the past, and he hopes to apply some of those lessons to his growing cannabis business. We're joined by Ben Kovler, founder and chairman of Green Thumb Industries. Uh, Great to have you on the show. So just remind us, so one of your ancestors invested in Jim Beam the whiskey. That's right. Thank you for having me, Andrew. Um, A fascinating story. So just remind us, Green Thumb Industries, what do you do? Because you're active in several states in the U.S. Uh, Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Green Thumb Industries is a U.S. cannabis licensed operator across the country. Uh, I'm from Chicago, um, but I think the brands, the brand promise, every bar you go into around the world has Jim Beam. That's not a coincidence. And we think the same thing is coming in cannabis. And just finally, you are staying out of some states, uh, including Colorado and Oregon. Oregon, of course, we've heard about plunging prices locally. That might be a temporary thing. But why would you be staying out of Colorado, for example? Simple case, supply demand. We believe in limited supply markets as a way to enter. In Colorado, the restriction on license is not very low. It's not very high. So there's less of a barrier to entry. As students of Warren Buffett, we believe in a moat around the business. And so limited license markets are attractive investment opportunities. That's interesting. And we've heard Oregon, they gave out hundreds of licenses as well. Ben, fascinating stuff. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. So I, my apologies. I kind of said that without saying that. So yeah, and I, I and see. I don't speak for the individual members. I speak for the association and the position the association takes on as a whole. Right. So I asked David Lakeman the same question and I said, you know, people point to Oregon and even Oklahoma and they mm-hmm. always say the price is the you and you said it. You just said it. The mm-hmm. the supply gets so high, the prices drop and then people go out of business. My question is, there are several other industries with high failure rates. The restaurant industry, most people cite the fact that 80% of restaurants go out of business in the first five years. The tech industry, Brad Spearson knows all about it. He started in uh, the dot-com right. days. We talk it's, about wi- it. <laughs> it's widely known and accepted that this industry has high rates of failure. Fitness industry, gyms, yoga studios, retail industry, grocery stores. Why do we allow, why are, why are we protecting cannabis operators? Like what is... Is that the function of these license limitations? Because it seems like they are, because you just, you and many others have said it keeps the wholesale price at a level that is profitable. I, I think probably because the cannabis industry in and of itself is still a nascent industry. Um, it's brand new, uh, just starting. It also has the um, kind of overlay of an attempt to allow people that were disproportionately, I can say it, I'm not, I'm not in government, particularly uh, minorities who were disproportionately impacted, who were incarcerated, who entire communities were affected by the loss of young men, fathers, sons. Um, I, I think that that has made us careful about wanting people to succeed in the industry and reduce that number of failures. Yeah. So it's it's two perhaps distinct uh, goals of the program is to ensure its um, success and then specifically to ensure the availability of minorities to get into the industry and be successful. Fair enough. And I, I just wonder, this is totally your personal opinion because I'm all for giving a leg up to operations uh, that can transfer wealth to disproportionately mm-hmm. impacted communities. I love the idea. I'm not opposed to it. Um, it just seems like limiting licenses 
is the wrong way to go about it. I just wonder, like, what do you think about the idea of a social equity fund where non-social equity license holders pay fees that automatically go into that fund? Because if we're, if we're wanting to help people that are DIA disproportionately impacted, like we need to give them assistance with licensing and regulation. I don't feel like just limiting the number so that they have a golden ticket should be the only way. They do do that, by the way, Cole. They did. They they it was oh, they required. Do. Yeah, it was required in the CRTA that when um, the existing uh, I'll call them the legacy um, operators got their license renewed, that they also had to make a significant and I think it was in a hundred thousand dollars to a fund for social equity applicants to gain access to to help them with their um, business plan. And I will yeah. tell you, um, in addition to that. Um, I lost my train of thought. What was what was your other point that you made? Uh, so there, I was there, oh, there 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 is the, there is the fund. There's also a state fund um, that is available for forgivable loans that the governor just um, initiated not too long ago. Is that R three or is that something different? No, something completely different. Oh, thank you, thank you yeah. for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the R three program, obviously, as well, that goes back into actual communities. I think that that's a phenomenal program and that's 25% of all the tax revenues received from cannabis in the state. Yeah. So a quick quote from Shalene Title, who kind of has inspired my line of questioning. She wrote a paper <laughs> called Bigger is Not Better. By the way, she's also a University of Illinois alum. Uh, I didn't mention that. So um, pretty cool. Uh, but she said, limiting the extent to which one business can control the market, which by the way, we do that in Illinois. We, that is one of her proposals that we have in effect in Illinois, the 10 license cap for dispensaries mm -hmm. and the three license cap. That's something that she is, uh, I, I feel like she deserves credit for inspiring in, in many states, including our own. Um, but she's saying that that language should not be confused with language that limits the total number of cannabis licenses, business stores, businesses or stores in any jurisdiction. Such limits generally work to stifle a fair and open market because they create a bidding war that often rewards larger businesses with more resources or experience and presenting the elements of a winning application. That kind of goes back to my, I quoted Toy Hutchinson. It seemed like we made the application process competitive versus just operating the business. And, and I would opine that the application process was onerous, um, cost huge amounts of money to gain access to that application. And then many individuals spent upwards of $50,000 in finding consultants that helped them fill out and, and craft what they needed to craft in that application. Um, and we, the association and many of the stakeholders were very successful in lobbying our legislature as well as the administration. And now that application process is very, very streamlined and most of the vetting goes on after the application has been accept, accepted as one of the um, license awardees, conditional license holders. So we were we were actually very, very fortunate um, in that regard. And as to, um, again, the cap on the license, the conversation, I can only share with you the conversation that was had when the CRTA was being drafted and negotiated is that mm -hmm. it was always the intent that this would be something that was in the beginning as they didn't want to just open it because they had too many um, examples from um, the consultants that the state was that the state was engaged with at the time of open markets that failed. And so I believe that they actually structured the legislation to have limits to allow for that growth, that methodical, very slow growth with the intent that once they felt the market was more mature, that those caps would be eliminated. We just haven't gotten there, unfortunately, because of COVID and some of the other lawsuits that we bumped, on to, bumped up into in Illinois. Yeah. And can I ask, I guess, as an individual and maybe as an association, well, let's start with as an association. Do you have a stance? It seems like you're saying, no, you don't have a stance on capping licenses, except no, for maybe the moratorium. We do, we do not. It was it was in the um, legislation. And so we've always, you know, respected the legislation and we followed the uh, regulations. And, and personally, I have to tell you, honestly, I know because I am the executive director of a very large association with very diverse members, I don't ever take a personal opinion. 
My, oh. my, it's, it's hard to, to make the distinction between Pam Altoff as the executive director and Pam Altoff as an individual. So I just kind of sort of keep my own personal opinions to myself and I follow the uh, direction and guidance of my board. Fair enough. I thought about trying to get the opinion. I just, sure. this is, I, this is my chance of trying to ask for your opinion. <laughs> like, do you agree with the logic I use with the other industries of high failure rates and like what, what, it, what is so different about the cannabis industry? Like what's so special about it besides it being nascent? You I, know? I, because again, it's, it's fraught, I believe with pitfalls, the pushback from um, a society that was raised that, you know, marijuana was the gateway drug to <laughs> yeah. horrifically horrible results. It, it's going to take us a little time to change that narrative and get people more comfortable and normalize the use. And so I think legislators in particular who have to go back and respond to that criticism and respond to those, you know, older teachings are very sensitive to ensuring that we do it right, that, that, yeah. that we promote responsible usage and that we have, again, a highly regulated industry that we know is going to be not only successful, but responsible. And so that's, that's where I think you, you feel that. And again, Illinois, you have to remember, Illinois was the first state to do it legislatively. Everyone else did it via referendum. So you knew that the public was basically supporting all of these initiatives. We did it legislatively. So there was, um, I think, a, a, an extraordinarily large concern that we do it right. Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head. I think like where I'm getting frustrated, where I get frustrated and I think others get frustrated is like, on one hand, we've agreed, we seem to agree, like cannabis should be legal. It's safe. There's no problem. But on the other hand, it's so highly regulated and like i don't have you seen the report about uh i know you're familiar with it but i don't know if you've actually seen the report i show it on the podcast sometimes they did a comparison and how opioids can be transported versus cannabis have you seen that no i haven't okay maybe i'll pull it up because it's only three minutes long i think you're going to really enjoy it um well um, opioids are our prescription medication correct Yes, they are. They are. But well, so uh, again, I mean, I I would say that that's the the difference is they are recognized as a medicine and they are prescribed and there's you know there's that regulation, not so much with you know adult use cannabis. Right. So there is there is a little bit of a distinction there. I would I would say. Yeah, I think one of the things that the report showed that I just thought you might find interesting is that. Uh, they show that like federal guidance would allow somebody to deliver opioids to a location sure. via bicycle, uh, via the front seat of their car versus what you got, what you and your business associate association have to do in order to deliver it is put it in a van, lock that in compartment and there's cameras. It's like you're transporting uranium, <laughs> you know, I, I, again, I, I have no, no response to, to that, except in the beginning, I think people were overly concerned about making sure. I mean, look at they put all the cultivation sites in a state police district. Does that not tell you immediately that they wanted to ensure? OK, so, okay. again, it, it's all about where, you know, drugs for medicinal purposes, even opioids, are already somewhat ingrained in our societal approach to acceptance. Not so much with cannabis. And that's that's one of our goals as an association is to start to try and educate the public. And we always caution our customers and our clients and our patients, you have to be responsible or you're going to set us back and, we're, you know, we're going to have to reapproach trying to, you know, make people more comfortable with the usage of cannabis. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I've got the report pulled up. We'll we'll watch it as one of our last things before we wrap because okay. we're about at the top of our time. Um, I am curious. I wanted to make sure I didn't have questions when I talked to you earlier, but this morning I was like, I should really get it because you're just, I see your name in every, almost every article. I feel like you're the go-to person for like, I mean, because you represent the industry at large. So I wanted to make sure to at least have a few questions prepared um, in the spirit. <laughs> <Please. of that. laughs> so um, I think you're like this question. 
So it's kind of twofold. What do you think sets CBAI apart and what accomplishment accomplishments or initiatives are you most proud of? Um, I think what sets us apart is that we do have um, members from the legacy industry, from the medicinal industry, as well as being extraordinarily welcoming to new license holders. Um, what I'm very proud of is the establishment by Porsche Mittens, I might add, um, of the Minority Access Committee. Um, it's a free membership. Um, you get to come into all the meetings, all the events, et cetera, network with the existing industry, ask questions, um, you know, make those uh, relationships, those professional relationships, which hopefully helps new license holders as they move forward into the industry. Uh, very, very, very proud of that. It also gave many of those um, new entrances, new license holders, uh, a platform. They, they got to come and talk about what they were experiencing and some of their problems, which we then too, the, the association, then took it to our legislative uh, advocates and said, we have to fix this. This is what we're hearing from our members. You know, here are names. How do, how do you elevate that information so that we can help and make those changes? I, I really am very proud of that. And my, my last big is, is the diversity of the CBAI board now. When I came on in 2019, um, the board was made up of um, mostly men. I had, I had one female, uh, most of them were white. Uh, now we have a very diverse board of men and women, black, brown, really represent, and license holders, different license holders. So we have, you know, craft growers and dispensaries and multi-state and, and vertically integrated only in Illinois. So we have a really um, diverse board that speaks for the industry now and isn't so focused only on large operators. I'm, I'm, I'm really very proud that, that we've gotten that kind of support and interest in the association. Yeah, I think it's an awesome step. And one of the questions I asked Portia, which I realized she couldn't answer, but hey, maybe you can, or maybe you can tell me who I could talk to. I love this idea and I hope you do too. Maybe I wonder, you know, since you mentioned advocating for patients and stuff, do you think there would be a possibility of having like a patient advocate or a consumer advocate position? I realize it's a business association. No, but no, I love you because we have talked about that. Um, absolutely. I, th I think we need to definitely have as many stakeholders. But again, you know, we're, we're in the process of trying to ensure that people get up and operating. It's, it's we've stumbled and bumbled and now we have an opportunity to develop some momentum to get the new craft grow and the new dispensary licenses up and operating. And I think it's important now that we return our focus to our medicinal patients and what do they need? And it certainly would behoove us to have somebody from um, a, a user, you know, or a parent of um, a patient on the board, or at yeah. least, you know, even if it was ex officio, we, we could use that perspective. I'll be looking out for that opening. I would love to be the consumer advocate or whatever. I will remember that. That would be great. <laughs> yes. Yes. I feel like I've demonstrated my consistency at this point. So can I um, use this as an opportunity to, you know, there's, there's um, one, one of our initiatives this year too, was to start drawing attention to um, medical card reciprocity. In other words, allowing individuals who have a medical card in Illinois to go to other states that have a medical cannabis program and be able to use their medicinal card to get access to their products. So that's a big initiative we think needs to happen. In addition, conversations are ongoing right now about the inconsistency of access to your specific um, cannabis product for mm. medicinal patients, yep. because again, it's, it's not created in a machine. It's, it's a live product. Sometimes strains change. Sometimes an operator chooses not to grow that same strain. And, and what that ultimately does on, on the end to that patient who found great success, symptomatic relief, and now doesn't have access to that exact product anymore. So, so those are conversations and it, it would be nice to have somebody sitting at the table who could weigh in and help us and guide that conversation. So those, yeah. those are two issues that um, we're discussing now at infinitum. So, yeah. 
Yeah. It's good to acknowledge, like you say, cannabis is, I think you've even said this in the past. I listened to an interview you did in the past. You said cannabis is not a widget. It's a living product. The way I relate to it is sometimes I go to the market. My listeners have heard me use this example so many times. I go to the market. I'm, I really am hankering some grapes and strawberries and I look and they're just not good that day. You know, and so and maybe you go to a different store or maybe they're just not in season, whatever the case may be, mm-hmm. right? The same can be true of cannabis because it is, I look at it as produce. Um, so. with, with, with dire consequences, though, you, you get to go to another store and maybe find a better grape. In this case, you, there, yeah. there, is, there is no option, right? If there's not a grape, there's just not a grape. And, right. and that has some, I think, some significant consequences to patients who actually found that relief from that specific product and no longer have access to it anymore. So yeah, a yes. little, bit, little bit the same, but. No, that's an important distinction. Very important distinction. Cause I've heard similar things, you know, people have like a certain RSO they prefer and they can't find right. it. And then all of a sudden seizures come back, right? right. <laughs> Something like that. Oh, I forgot to ask you, sure. you know, you mentioned commission. I was in a meeting recently where the CROO was proposing an agency. Uh-huh. What's the difference? Um, the, the biggest difference is transparency. A commission has meetings in the public. They right. have them every month. Um, you know exactly what's going on. Um, you have access to those commissioners. They're still appointed by the governor. So there still is obviously that, you know, administrative um, oversight. But the, the biggest difference is the transparency and the access to commissioners and the availability of being significantly more nimble in addressing them and interpreting the law. Yeah. Now I realize I'm, you know, I'm asking you to speak on something. Maybe you can't, but why do you think there is a push all of a sudden, you know, the, the state had pushed for a, a commission in the past. Now they're proposing an agency. What's the road? You know what? I, I can't opine. I, I, I have no idea. And you're right. The state did. We originally had spoken with the crew officer at the time and had discussed a commission. And that's, we went in that direction and thought again, it was very similar to all the other um, sin taxes in Illinois gaming and um, liquor. And so obviously you would have a cannabis commission that would follow suit. I, I can't opine as to why that that changed. The change I still heart. think that, you know, again, I love the idea of putting cannabis under one, you know, umbrella. I just don't think that you get the transparency and the, um, rapid response that a, a nascent industry needs and a commission would be certainly in the better interest of the industry. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was, that was, uh, an interesting thing. So, and I noticed you mentioned commission earlier, so I also wanted yes. to kind mm-hmm. of clarify that you, it sounds like you support the idea of a commission versus an agency. So, um, we, 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 again, you know, experts, experts in the industry who would be helping us move forward, analyzing what needs to come next, you know, having more data. Um, it, it just is, is the better way to go. And we've had examples of that, obviously, since I, I don't know, when was liquor 1934, something like that. Yeah. What efforts, if any, are being made to ensure that cannabis products are affordable and accessible for patients and consumers? We talked about patients, but just consumers too. Oh, uh, um, this is the, the tricky area. Um, obviously, um, there's only a 1% tax on medicinal products. Um, so that obviously keeps the costs substantially lower. Um, Illinois made the decision uh, in the CRTA to tax at a higher rate, higher potency products. Right. Um, I would tell you that that is a concern um, of the association, not one that we have taken an active position on, but we have uh, been working with several educational institutions with regard to, you know, white papers and studies and data about what that does to the industry. Um, I currently can opine for my association that we believe that the tax rate is too high. We think that, um, again, this is an educational opportunity to educate our legislators on exactly what's happening. I think it will become more abundantly apparent as we start looking at um, how many of our Illinois residents now go to Missouri to buy product. Um, That was literally my next question. Absolutely. And and it will become, um, again, a, a decision of the legislature 
to reevaluate whether it still makes sense to have that kind of a tax um, increase for higher potency products or whether we can bring that down and reevaluate the entire tax structure for the product on the retail side. Yeah. I, I was, so yeah, like I was going to say my next question and I know we're about at the top of our time, so I'll be mindful of that. Um, I saw the CROO has a new website, which is actually really nice. I don't know if you've checked it out, but there's like a lot of different ways they're displaying data. Um, and I have not right. even had the chance to like, honestly digest it all. But one of the things I saw and I'm trying to pull it up right now, I might not be able to, um, wasn't necessarily prepared to have this, but I've seen that for at least the last, I think two to three months, sales have dropped here. Mm -hmm. I think I can show that. Do you attribute that to Michigan and Missouri? Do you, are you, are people kind of shaking in their boots at the fact that Michigan and Missouri, I mean, look, I, the reason I'm asking it that way is because I helped, or I'm very involved in the community. We've even got a, a little forum with like 30,000 Illinoisans, 30,000. And it's not, let me just say, it's very common for people to travel to Michigan and Missouri to purchase their products. And some of them even purchase products from members of your own association because they sell them at a lower price in Michigan. I, you know, uh, um, <laughs> you're not supposed to travel across the lines, but whatever. I know, I know. Um, yeah. So, and, and again, Kentucky has, has introduced legislation again to recreationalize cannabis. So now, now we have three, uh, potentially yeah. three states that surround Illinois. Um, all coming online uh, recently. And and I, I don't know if I'd say shaking in their boots, but they sure as heck are paying real close attention, particularly those um, dispensaries that specifically located themselves close to those borders, assuming that the, the traffic would right. be the one way. Um, and so, yeah, I, I again, I, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity um, for us to reevaluate how we are taxing cannabis in Illinois. And, and I do think that, you know, we're going to have uh, really good data, as you just pointed out, um, on crew uh, to make that evaluation. Yeah. I wanted to get back to taxes really quick, sure. um, but I just wanted to ask, like, I know that this probably is putting you in a weird position, but what, how is, like, what? I know there's market factors at play, but it's pretty crazy to see some of the operators in Illinois, like, uh, I've got a cartridge around here somewhere and that product goes for a, like $110 before taxes in Illinois. But that same cartridge goes for $30 in Michigan. I could buy like four cartridges for the same price as one. Um, and that goes across the board. And these are operators that I know that there's market factors at play and this is a tough right. question, right. but like, yeah. Well, regulation, testing standards. I mean, again, I told you, Illinois is highly regulated. And so there's yeah. a high cost to producing that product in Illinois. So yep. that's, that's going to make the price go up, um, you know, and then the, the higher tax rate. Makes sense. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, again, I guess what, what I'll say is because Illinois ran into significant issues with new operators starting up, it really put the whole industry kind of, I think, behind the eight ball and dealing with exactly these types of operational issues, you know, reevaluating the, the cost of cannabis, reevaluating um, testing standards, reevaluating how um, regulated we are. You know, maybe we need to roll back a little bit because we've been relatively responsible for the last three years. The, I really believe those conversations will be much more at the fore once we get our industry, um, our new license holders up and operational. That that really is what kind of took the oxygen out of the room, so to speak. Cool. Well, I've got two more questions for mm -hmm. you. Um, you brought up taxes. Look, I don't agree with basically anything these people say. Smart approaches to marijuana. Are you uh, aware or are you familiar no. with them? They are one of the most well-known prohibitionist group. They oppose cannabis. <laughs> no I've, had them on, them. Yeah, so. I've had them on my show several times, but one of the arguments they make and they've made in the past, and I'd be interested to hear your response. They've pointed to California saying, Hey, the taxes are too high. We got to lower them. And they'll be like, but wait, I thought you, I thought you legalized cannabis to get that tax money. 
which is, I mean, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I thought we did. What do you, how do you take on that critique? And I'm acknowledging that it comes from a group that I don't take sure. seriously. <laughs> we, of, of course, it, of course, there was a monetary consideration. I mean, the the cash flow of money and the illicit market was extraordinarily high. Why shouldn't it be that we capture some of those dollars? But I don't think that we meant to only have high taxes to get the money. I mean, we, we would get the money because it's new revenue, right? So we would receive funds. Sure. Um, and in Illinois, we specifically allocated uh, those taxes to very specific purposes. You know, as you said, the R3 program, which gives money back to communities, um, law enforcement, um, responsible education about usage of cannabis. I mean, we really divided the money up to substance abuse programs. I mean, very specific um, topics so that it wasn't just to get money to spend it on anything. That money has a purpose in Illinois and that's what it's being used for. Yeah. And I will just be honest in saying that it's always been weird to me that acknowledging the drug war was a failure. We legalize cannabis and then we tax the people that decide to use cannabis. It's like, are you punishing me? What am I doing? What am I? You know? Uh, but anyway, so that's just a thought. Um, not no, it's a good thought. <laughs> I might steal the argument. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, please do. Um, so, hey, I you you mentioned your age earlier. Uh, I'm a good friend of Brad Spearson and Mike Fouché. I saw that you announced retirement almost a year ago. What's Actually, going on it was 18 that? months ago. <laughs> oh, okay, damn. Yeah, damn. That was yeah. yeah longer than I thought, but I'm not, I don't want you to go. I had a lot of good time with you today and I'd love to have you back on the show. Um, but what's going on? Um, you know, I'm, I, even in my legislative career, I believe that there is a time to move on and allow a new set of eyes and somebody with, you know, different perspectives to come in. Um, I promised um, when I took this position on that I would stay the two or three years it took to get the trade association up and running and solicit members and get the board in a good position. I've done that. Um, we were a little slower than we thought we would be on reorganization because we got very much engaged in other programs. Um, again, attempting to help our minority access members and elevating uh, their success in the industry. Uh, but now's the time for me to go on. I may not leave the industry, but it's time for a new person to take over and, and do the next iteration and the next evolution of the association. So um, I'm very excited for them. I really am. I think, I think it's, it's change is good. Evolution is good. You know, diversity so, is good. I don't, I'm not trying to pin you into a date, but like, do you have a time? Oh, no, I do. It'll, <laughs> I do. <laughs> It'll be at the end of session. Um, okay. we'll, we'll get through this legislative session. It's hard to put somebody um, in a new position in the middle of what we're talking about, negotiations and dealing with things. But at the end of the session, I will be moving on. And by that time, I think there'll be an announcement as to, you know, a new individual and what they're doing and where they're going. So, um, I, I, again, I wish them all the best of luck. I think that they will grow and be stronger still. So, um, but you may see me in a different capacity in the industry. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And I'd cool. love to come back. This has been wonderful. I truly appreciate the um, opportunity that you've given us. Truly. Yeah. No, I appreciate your time and I know we're at the top of it. So uh, we'll leave it at that. I would love to have you back on the show in the future. I'm uh, looking forward to whatever the future holds for you. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll keep my eyes open for that community advocate uh, position, please, you know, because please do. I, and I do want to talk to you. So we may have to go offline and I may have to give you a holler back later. Cool. Sounds okay, good. All great. right. Well, folks, I hope you Thanks. enjoyed this episode. We'll see you on the next one.